ready to start it up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so we'll continue on through part seven of our uh, Silman's Endgame course. And we were talking about Rook and Pawn Endgames when we left off. We still have a little bit of Rook and Pawn stuff to do. Let me see. Yeah, just one or two more examples of Rook and Pawn. Then we got Bishop Endgames and then Queen Endgames. Well, I'm sorry that I think we did meet them. He says, long time no see. Oh, well, mm -hmm. yeah, it depends you how gotta, long ago it was. You got to come more frequently. Mm -hmm. Then you'll be remembered. So we'll look at Rook and Four against Rook and Three. In this endgame, the defender has the following fears. One, the stronger side's pawn will create the kind of big squeeze we've seen last time, like in Rook and 3 against Rook and 2, if you remember mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. Or two days ago, I guess it was now. Two, the transposition into a poor Rook and 3 against Rook and 2, or Rook and 2 against Rook and 1 will occur. So those are things that the defending player has to watch out for. The big squeeze and those bad versions of Rook and 3 against Rook and 2 and Rook and 2 against Rook and 1. Alright, so the defender must exchange pawns favorably whenever possible. That's always an important defensive technique. When you're worse or lost in an endgame, you want to trade the pawns off. We've talked about that multiple times already. Uh... Yeah, you got to prevent the stronger side's pawn from swarming down the board. It should be stopped in two ways. One, use your own pawns to stop the enemies, or use the rook to tie down the enemy king to the defense of its pawns. All right, let's look at this position. Oh, and for those that don't know and didn't read the title of the lecture, we're just working our way through Silman's complete endgame book, and we're in section seven. Mm -hmm. finishing it up and all of the um, previous lectures can be seen video on demand and also on our YouTube channel and then we'll re return to some other studies once we're done with the Silman. All right so here we have this position uh, whoever's turn it is it's actually pretty important this is a typical starting position for rook and four against rook and three um, Black to play here. Well, maybe actually, maybe you know, Karen, or somebody in the chat knows the best defensive move in this position with black to play. This black is something that actually I even teach my students because it's very easy to understand. And it's also important for your understanding of pawn majorities, which oh, obviously okay. white does have a pawn majority here. So what's the move that black should play if it's black to play? Oh, Scottish demon goats in here. We're on part seven, uh, page 295, in case you want to follow along at home. Hmm. You got it, the taw. Well, Warnaki, that's uh, trading the pawns and offering a draw is what Black wants to do. <laughs> yeah, White could still try to win it. it. Looks like some people in the chat know some defensive technique, huh? Interesting. Interesting if true. What do you think, Karen? What would you play with black? Um, yeah, I really have no idea what to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were, you know, going to play something. <laughs> <laughs> Got to play something. Yeah. I would... Um, I know that doesn't make sense. b6 illegal i like it x clam offering a draw would be in very bad sportsmanship here <laughs> if you have black well i mean it, it seems like you have to either go h5 or maybe move move the rook to the fourth rank but i'm not sure i don't know what moving the rook to the fourth rank does well it doesn't help i guess because yeah, the rook's good here. Because it can move the f-pawn, yeah. Yeah, it's tying the king down to the f-pawn and pinning the f-pawn. Mm -hmm. Yes, h5 is the defensive technique. Because you can't move your f-pawn because then you can be checked. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's not great. The idea here is that if white wants to win this, white's going to need to make a queen. Mm -hmm. If white wants to make a queen, he's going to have to make pawn breaks to make a passed pawn, right? Mm -hmm. With this setup... 
we make it so that in order for white to make a pass pawn, he has to go here. In order for him to go here, he has to go here. In order for him to go there, he's got to play g4. So basically, he has to play h3, g4, f5, e6. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that white can make a pass pawn. While white's doing that, black will take and take and take and be left with just one pawn. And hopefully we'll have a fill it or a position for a draw in that case, like we've seen many times already. So this is the correct setup to have if you're ever defending three against four. And a couple people in the chat knew about it. Mm. Yeah. Rule in this kind of four versus three rook endgame, h5, which, uh, which is all, uh, another typo here. Which is spelled W H C H. There's no oh, I. Really? <laughs> <laughs> which stops White from playing the space gaining move G three G four, is a huge accomplishment. Thank oh, you, G M Benjamin, Benjamin Feingold. Feingold. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I is a premium letter. You have to pay for it on Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> so yeah, H five is the way to go, and just like, who was it in the chat? Past Pawn says it stops G four, which is kind of nice as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it, Bell's a sub has a question. H5 is not played. Yeah. Well, you yeah. If you don't play F5, H5 and I play G4, F5, E6, we'll at least keep H pawns on the board. You'll play G F G F F E F E, but that won't be a Philidor position, will it? Because there's still H pawns on the board. That'll give white more winning chances more pawns on the board equals more winning chances that's for sure so that's the idea is that if they make a pass pawn we get to trade off all the pawns with h5 therefore if it's white's turn white should obviously play g4 as you might imagine and this would enable white to keep an extra set of pawns on the board and have more winning chances in that case um, so that's why, yeah, if it's white's turn, g4 is the best move. If it's black's turn, h5 is the best move. It doesn't mean that g4 wins. It just gives black more to do, more to defend, which obviously you don't want to do. You know, you want to have, you want to just get a Philidor position you've already seen and just play it as to a draw, like you always would. Um, all right, so let's say... It's Black's turn, and Black does play it. Black has managed to get in the extremely useful h5 advance. He should now draw easily by following our basic formula. Exchange pawns. Use the rook to tie down white's king to the defense of its pawns. Here's one possible continuation. Oh, see, I actually put the rook in the wrong square here, not that it matters. The white rook. There we go. Doesn't really hardly matter at all. Yeah. Still h5. h3. Rook b2. The rook is happy to stay on that f pawn. This is what we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. g4. Of course we trade. And now here's a good defensive move at this point. g5. Yes. So still, if white wants to make a pass pawn, we sort of changed it a bit with black here. If white wants to make a pass pawn, he'll have to play f4. Then we can exchange on f4. Then the only way to make a pass pawn is to play g6. That's the only way that, that, that those two pawns will make a pass pawn against black's f pawn. Mm -hmm. In which case, we're already in position for a Philidor defense if they make a pass g pawn. right? We already have our king right in front, just like we want. Yeah, telling White any for future advance of the F pawn will lead to more pawn exchanges. Yes. Uh, rook C3. If White plays King G3 in order to play F4, we can play Rook B3, thereby stopping F4. Because our pawn's attacked. So Rook C3 prepares to play King G3 F4. Now we got a really solid setup here. It's a good idea to keep the rook as active as possible. It's almost always the case, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. 
This move creates a little bit of checking distance too. Set up some checks on the first rank. Oh, a thousand bits from Nicola. <laughs> Yay, thank Thanks, you, Nicola. Nicola. Was H5 trivial for GM Benjamin Feingold? Of course, he, know, he knows that, yes. <laughs> Rook C7. Preparing to advance the F pawn. So now uh, I've check and up, we can try to check you here and then go around here, try to take that. Get little, some chances there. Mm -hmm. Check. I have to defend the pawn. Check. Now black has the threat to play rook a3. That'd be kind of annoying. But, you know, if you step your king back up, I'll just keep checking you. So we can try check. But now that the king is not on the third rank, we can step up. This check won't be met by us being forced to go backwards anymore. We can go forwards now. And uh, at this point, it's pretty clear that white's not going to win. It even just says draw already. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, I mean, that's the type of thing, like, H5 is you just, you know that. Like, I've already, I've known that for, you know, years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No passive rook, Scottish demon goat. Come on. <laughs> you know better than that. <laughs> hey, Scottish demon goat. Let's see. So this scenario was easy, but even if white manages to trick black into a worst case scenario, knowledge of the Philidor gone bad endgame that we looked at last time, maybe two times ago, I forgot now, should be enough to save the day. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at a tougher example here. Mm. And shout out to Nicola. Yay, Hippets subscribed at tier one. Thank you, Hippets. <laughs> I love that little face. <laughs> That is pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Chess bra pog. All right. Here we go. Now here it's black to move. Um, so this is a tough position for black, obviously. It's equal pawns, but he's going to lose his pawn, right? On f6. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. So, you know, because even if you defend it, we'll check you. Or just take it. But I'd probably check so uh this is a tough one for black if you imagine this coming from a four against three situation or you know you know then three against two and two against one and then down to this position uh it, it's clear that white's made some real progress white's king's really good black's king is bad and white's pawn is pretty far advanced mm -hmm. um but don't panic for example rookie eight Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. You said for six months? I couldn't even t tell by the message. That's awesome. Yeah, they've got sales going on in September. September. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to lose. Yeah, we've seen this from part four as well. So go back and check out that video if you don't think, if you don't believe it. Yay, thank you, Pass Pawn, for that sub subscription. Fortunately, if you studied, if you studiously learned the lessons in the order given, like uh, we've been doing, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be aware of the Philidor gone bad formula. And without hesitation, you can throw your rook behind the soon to be passed F pawn. Rook F4 X clam. Best move. This is an ideal since we'd prefer the rook on F1 for more checking distance, but mm -hmm. we'll take what we can get. King takes. Now he's threatening mate. I wonder what we should do about that, Karen. Hmm. Um. See if the chat knows about it. If they remembered from, uh, you know, previous episodes. Should be able to help him out. Scottish demon goat always wants illegal b6. <laughs> it's a running joke, I guess. <laughs> um, darn. I don't know. Um. Uh -oh. Hey, what's up? Yeah. Um. Bring. Just bring me my wallet over there for my bag. Um. Let's see. 
I'm not sure. You'll have to help me out on this one. It's not really a puzzle. <laughs> it's just stuff that we've already learned. I know. I just don't remember. Well, what are your options? Tell me some options. Well, um, you, you know, rook d4, king g8. Any other move to stop mate? Um, One more. The, let's see. Well, I mean, you could take, take the pawn. <laughs> oh, I don't want to I know. I'm lose the rook. I'm just telling you. Okay. It would stop me. You asked well, me. not really. I mean, it was, it would be mate in five or something, you know, um, seven or whatever. Let's see. I'm not sure what you need. Is that enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, can you bring me some tea? I was just going to do the chocolate. No lemon? Okay, bring me some tea with no lemon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll make you go king e8. All right, those are the three moves that stop mm -hmm. mate. Any other moves going to be made pretty quickly. Yeah. So, rook e4 is going to lose like how we just saw. I know, because they're going to queen if they, tr if they trade off or whatever else. Yeah, yeah, that'll even, right, that's even easier than what we just saw, right? Check here. I know, I was just takes, trying to give takes, you all the King options. G2, King G7. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it was wrong for you to say this. This was the right thing for you to say. I know. I'm explaining to you that it loses. I know. I was just okay. clarifying what I said. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, so the options are the king moves, right? Mm hmm And if you remember from what we said last time, which side is the wrong side? It rhymes with um, the word wrong. <laughs> I thought you typically want the king on the short side and the rook on the other side. Yeah, the long side is the wrong side. I couldn't remember the saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough to remember. But yeah, the long, the long side is the wrong side. You don't want your king on the long side. So king g8 is going to draw here. Okay. This is the way to do it. You want your king on the short side. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It gives your rook more checking distance if you have to check from this side. Mm -hmm. Whereas if your king is over here, it'll block the rook. From checking mm -hmm. at some point so yeah you want your king on the short side and your rook to go to the long side for sideways checks if necessary mm -hmm. and that's why uh, king g8 is the right defensive technique here rook a8 check play the best move here the only legal move and then here and now if okay let's say they tr they could also try this to go here but then we can go all the way for the checks. This is where the long side of the rook is, is coming in handy here. Yeah. And then if they go here to stop the checks, you go back again. This is, We discussed this last time, mm -hmm. actually. It was a little different, but you know, it was the same idea. But after here, king g7, you can't make any progress. You can't push the pawn. Um, you can check. And then here, and then we'll play king g8 again. Right. That's not going to help. Uh, or if you check here, and then, or if you push, rather, I can keep checking you forever now. Yeah, because you can't hide in front of your pawn anymore. Right. Classic fill it or draw. So, yeah, if you know about some defensive technique, you can get to rook and pawn against rook where you can draw it because you already know it's a draw that's the way to defend when it's like rook and four against rook and three rook and three against rook and two you eventually your opponent can get rook and pawn against rook and you just have to make sure it's it's a, a rook and pawn against rook you can draw or obviously if you're trying to win then you want the opposite of course mm -hmm. all right so we've already seen that in rook and four against rook and three exchanging pawns is something the defender loves to see and that leaves a stronger side with only one other idea. He needs to avoid trades and gain some space by pushing the center pawns up the board. Let's take a look at how you could try to do it. What are you laughing uh, well, at? they're just coming up with silly rhymes. Long is wrong, short is the retort. Now we'll, <laughs> now we'll remember. <laughs> I do like that one. Scottish demon goat. <laughs> Mm 
Wernacki says, short makes you snort in remembrance of the many times you wept long and lost. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a poem. That is good. All right, White to play it. So Black threatens to make things difficult for White by playing the move E5. Um, White can draw after that by playing Rook B6, which stops the king from moving forward. But it's, uh, it's complicated to draw that and far beyond what the student needs to know at this stage of endgame training. Mm -hmm. Yay, thank you, Dancing Tortoise. Nice. For the subscription. Yeah. However, knowing that such positions are dangerous is important, and this knowledge should frighten the defender so much that he goes out of his way to avoid the advance of the e-pawn. The best move here is surprisingly f4. Yes. Mm -hmm. f4 is the easiest defense in this position. This defensive posture is proven remarkably efficient. So what's nice about this is that um, you can't really move like any pawn without trading pawns for black, right? And um, white still has one weak pawn on g3. You know, so it's not like you gave yourself an extra weak pawn. Either way, you have a weak f pawn or a weak g pawn that you have to defend with the king. Um, but this stops black from playing e5 and trying to get his king out and advancing his center pawns, which again, that's still a draw, as he said, but you're going to have to know more technique to draw that than you are to draw this. The f pawn stops black's e pawns in its track while white's rook ties the king down to the f pawn. Mm -hmm. So you can't play like f6, e5 because it's pinned. And you can't move the king away because I'll take it. And you can't move the king up because then you can't push your f pawn. Mm -hmm. Probably I'll play rook b5, I'm guessing, in that case. Well, actually, after here, he just goes here. But well, still, you can't move your king up, yeah, because he'll take this. Hey, it's so cold. Hey, Gladkov16, thank you. He likes the stream. Okay. So. Yeah, black can try this, though. it has got to try something, otherwise white just goes here and back, mm -hmm. and, white, and black can't do anything. There's nothing black can do. So he can try this. So he can step up. Now he's doing something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to lose some pawns, though, obviously, frankly. Threatening mate. Which one is he going to take? This one? Here? But obviously this is going to draw. I mean, it's a rook pawn and our king's in front. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be pretty easy to draw. Yeah. He even says with a hopelessly drawn position. Hopelessly drawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was a good example. You know, I, I wouldn't have played f4 here. Yeah, was, that's count, counterintuitive like, to me because the neck king's just... Totally dead. Hide. Yeah. He's down, yeah. But, but yeah, it's, uh, there's nothing that black can do about it. Like, there's, there's only a finite amount of ideas on the board. And uh, you can't push your F-pawn. It's illegal. You can't push your G-pawn. I'll take it. And this one, will I'll win it or trade. So there's nothing to do other than run your king up and lose all your pawns. But then, as we saw with this example, it's enough to, uh, to draw because we trade all the pawns away, except you have one that's a rook pawn. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, nice defense there. Yeah. Can black try to get the rook to e7? Like this, and then rook there, 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 there? He can, you know, after f4. By that time, my king will be up here, um, and then I'll move my rook away, I guess, there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you go here, I do nothing, and you do like this. I guess I'd go here to stop this move. But yeah, now I got my king out instead of here, and your rook was is a lot worse now. And it's still difficult to make progress. Although perhaps you can still try f6. Well, f6, I'll play king e4, then you can't play e5. Yeah. So you can't play e5 now, I'll just win a pawn. Mm. And then if you bring your king around, I can check you until you're not controlling the square. Give me some checking distance here. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I can't quite make any progress. 
Wernicke says he doesn't think Silman emphasizes enough how important it is to restrict moves to nigh squares. Yeah. As a principle. That could be true. I don't know. It seems like he does an okay job of that for me, but <laughs> maybe it's obvious to me. It's not obvious to you. I don't mm -hmm. know. He did well. He doesn't really phrase it that way. Mm -hmm. You do when you're talking That's true. about it, but he doesn't. So I could see that. Hey, Nicola Drummer and John John Seff. <laughs> Anyways, we can go on through uh, to Bishop Endgame now. So. Yeah, definitely. Let's see, just a few of those. It seems this section has a lot of prose in it, and then the Queen Endgame only has like one or two pages. Hmm. All right, we've looked at uh, some bishops of opposite color endgames, but what about bishops of same color? The presence of opposite colored bishop gives the defender more hope of drawing. Uh, but usually, if it's bishops of same color, the side with an extra pawn or more than one pawn is going to be winning. Okay, let's take a look at this example. There, put some bishops on the board. Make sure I put them on the right squares this time. Here we go. White to play. So here, white wins easily. When up a pawn with no other pawns remaining, the stronger side has winning chances if the pawn is advanced and if the defending king isn't able to get in front of it, like here. Mm -hmm. Pawn's very far advanced, the defending king is very far away. Uh... Yeah, in general, a situation will occur uh, where the defending bishop is preventing the pawn from advancing, like here, and an immediate draw would result if you push the pawn and they take it. So the stronger side can only win if his own bishop can block the diagonal. For example, bishop e5. Random move, bishop c7, game over. Nothing mm -hmm. you can do about that yeah. now. Even if the weaker side's bishop is on the long diagonal, the game is still in the bag. Let's say, for example, here, we'll just change the bishop's placement. Put this bishop, where do you want it? Here? There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so in this position, uh, black's bishop is control in control of this diagonal. Makes things a little bit more difficult for white. I mean, white can't, for example, go bishop there to block the bishop now because the king is on the other side. But it's still going to it's still gonna be a win. See, I did it again where he actually moved the bishop. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> but anyways, we can't go like here and there to do it, right? Right. Instead, he goes around like this, bishop a5. He goes to the queening square. That's the way to go. And then bishop d8. Bishop e7. Now we're ready to queen. So he stops us. But bishop d6 again to go to c7, and now we win. Can't stop us from playing bishop c7 and queening after that. Got him. Mm. Yay, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you asked for a or sweet. Oh, you did it there. That was what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky. Hey, bring my change back. To have any drawing chances, the defending king must be directly in front of its counterpart. Let's take a look at a different example. Make sure I put all the pieces on the right square this time. There we go. This is correct. All right. So in this position, even with white to play, it's going to be a draw. Here's a rule. In this kind of endgame, center pawns only win if the defending king isn't on top of the action. So center pawns are harder to win with, apparently, because, uh, well, unless the king is far away. But with the king here, the, the idea, I think, is that the bishops have a, long, a lot of scope to defend the square. I can go here, and then I can also go around here to defend it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like, this might be more difficult. Sure, I have this diagonal, but it's tougher to get over here because this diagonal is so short. So it's easier for the defending side when it's a center pawn for this reason. We have a lot of room to go over and defend the queening square. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the king can't stop. King can't control a5 or h4. Or h4. There's no way. 
It's not going to control that and help queen. It's a king after all. So White's normal winning idea of chasing the bishop to the a5 d8 diagonal and then maneuvering the own bishop to c8 c7 rather is not possible because black's king controls that square so if we do the same idea we just saw like this mm -hmm. and then here let's go around like this once he goes to a5 because he's got to go to a5 now well we can't do it right not going right. to be able to yeah we'll just he'll just take it there are still some tricks you know, you could try this, but uh, he's not going to take it, right? <laughs> that would let you queen. Yeah. Yeah. And we have enough room to shuffle back and forth, is what I was talking about. We can shuffle back and forth here. We won't get zugzwanged. And uh, that's, again, that's the problem with having the center pawn. We have more room to shuffle back and forth than we otherwise would. Note that black didn't face any problems here because the c7 square is covered by the king and bishop. White's king is frozen because he needs to defend the pawn. He can never move without immediately agreeing to a draw. Black will never run out of tempi since he can shuffle his bishop. If it's on this diagonal, he can shuffle his bishop to several squares. Or if he's on this diagonal, he's got two squares. So either way, he's got, he's got room for his bishop. He won't be zugzwanged. In fact, this defense isn't possible if the pawn is a bishop pawn. Then we're going to get zugzwanged. Let's show an example. Like this. Play made for $1,000, says Jizz in your mouth, 6969. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me he's not serious. <laughs> Hey, focus crazy. I was saying it differently before. Welcome back. I didn't know you were banned, um, but glad to see you back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we have a position, white to play, white wins. White's first order of business, as we've already seen, is to kick the dark square bishop off of this diagonal. Mm -hmm. So bishop g7. To f8. We've seen that idea many times. Right. But we'll go to the queening square. We'll go here. Now we're threatening to queen, so he's got to play bishop h6. Yes. Our first goal has been reached. The bishop's now on the on the uncomfortably short diagonal, oh, yeah. h6 to f8. Now we can zugzwang him. We did it. Zugzwang. Easy zugzwang. Suddenly, black has no good moves. Moving the bishop off of the diagonal lets white queen. Off of this diagonal. Gonna let me queen. Okay, bishop g7 and f8 both hang the bishop now. King f6 is illegal. And other king moves allow bishop g7. I mean, king g5 even allows us to check. Which would be even easier way to win, I guess. Yeah. So... It's over already. Black can resign. Rule. The idea of a shortened defense diagonal means that one's winning chances improve when the pawn is a bishop pawn or a knight pawn. Here's a study that somebody made up. Hmm. Like this. Come on. A Scottish demon goat says, didn't B E3 work? Yeah, if king g5, bishop e3 works. Or instead of bishop d4. Or bishop e3. If bishop e3 instead of bishop d4, bishop g7. You want to zugzwang him. Bishop d4 takes away the g7 square. Bishop e3 just hopes that he'll take it so he can queen. But bishop d4 stopping bishop d You want to zugzwang him. Bishop e3, bishop g7 is not yet zugzwang. You still zugzwang him later, but, you know. Why doesn't the white pawn take the black king? Good question. <laughs> There's only a hundred reasons why not. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. White to play. Here white wins, as you might expect, because it's a rook pawn, right? But it is going to take some doing. White wins by chasing the black bishop off of this diagonal and into the shorter diagonal, a7 mm -hmm. to b8, right? 
So let's go bishop h4. But you said because it's a rook, rook pawn, what? Knight pawn. Oh, knight pawn, okay. <clears throat> there we go. We're ready to queen, so they do this. We've already seen this mm -hmm. construction before. Now, the bishop's on a really short diagonal. He's actually got no moves to go. Like, there's nothing he could do. However, we can't Zugzwang black here. Because let's say it's black's turn. Sure, black can't move the bishop, but he can move the king. And king doesn't... Not gonna, you know, affect anything. Mm -hmm. Any king move is fine. So we can't use Zugzwang like we just saw. Now we are gonna have to use uh, Scottish Demon Goat's idea of deflection with bishop e3. Game over. There's nothing black can do at this point. Mm. He can just resign. Um, now, so this is a fairly easy win, but black can actually defend a little bit better. Bishop h4, instead of moving back and forth and letting him go around and then letting him get us at the end, let's bring our king around town. King b5. To a6. See, now we can't play bishop a7 to b8 uh, anymore. It's yeah. tricky. It is a knight pawn currently. That's true. <laughs> Adam Dark Square says, it's hard to figure it out. God damn. He's right. <laughs> now, we stopped our normal idea. So we're going to have to find another one. What we're going to have to do is play bishop c7. Since he gave up c7 by moving here. So he's controlling these squares. The only way to get to c7 is here. We can't get on, I mean, we want to get on this diagonal, but we can't right now because his bishop's there. We can't go here because that's it going to be captured. So we have to go here to go here. Right. We have to go d8 to c7. So bishop c5 to go like this mm -hmm. is the idea. Although, you know, I was thinking to go here. Maybe he could go back. Or back like this. But anyways, let's see how this continues. Because once I go here, isn't that the same as going here? What's the difference, right? Let's see. I, I don't know how to win this. Has to go here. Otherwise, the bishop will get to c7. Right. And then go back here. So it seems like black stopped white yet again. But now a nice maneuver shows the game is in fact over. Bishop f6, exclam. Another deflection, right? Can't take because we'll queen. The nice thing about this is it gains a tempo. It's attacking the bishop. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to do this, and he doesn't have time to stop us anymore because his bishop's hanging. He'll have to move his bishop, then we go here. And now we're going to a7 for sure no matter what you do at this point. Wait, can you go back? Sure. Just let's do one more. Um, so you couldn't, I uh, bishop d6, and what do they do? Here. Oh, yeah, back around. Yeah, that's okay. all we need to do. Okay. And that's what's going to happen after here. Oh, the same thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> no, we did it. As we saw. Nice. So, we got to go back and see why is bishop c5 the only winning move here? Bishop c5, remember. Mm -hmm. So what I learned is that if we go here and do that, the bishop will be on h2. Like when we play bishop c5, we have he has to move his bishop now. This is Zugzwang. Black has to move the bishop. And then this is allowing us in this position 
to play this move, threatening the bishop and getting over to this diagonal. Oh, yeah. Whereas if we did this uh, without bishop c5, like let's say we did this like I wanted to, mm -hmm. to go here and here. Now when we do this, we can't play that same type of move. Like right. where it was bishop f6 attacking the bishop here and going here. We can't play bishop i3. Right, we can't play bishop to i3. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And then going to g1 to a7. So we have to provoke the bishop to move. And this move is a zugzwang. Like if, if black didn't have to move, white can't win. White can't win with this maneuver. We'll go here. But because the bishop has to move, then that's what's making us win with bishop f6 at the end here. Like this. Mm-hmm. So the real question is, why doesn't any like sort of normal bishop move win then? All three of these moves should win, if that's the case. But he'll ex hopefully he'll explain it to me. Yeah, why was bishop c5 the only way, way to win? Wouldn't bishop e3 be more effective? All right, it's important that we understand this. So let's go bishop e3. So bishop c5 took away bishop d6, whereas these two moves don't take away bishop d6. So he'll play bishop d6 now. Now we can do the same idea, but it's not going to win for some reason. Can't wait to find out why. This is why. If here, because the bishop's on d6, the same trick that we pull every time to deflect isn't going to work. We can back it up. You can't go here now because our king covers that. Oh, yeah. That's why bishop c5 is the winning move. Because now you can't play bishop d6. You have to put your bishop on one of these squares where now these tricks will always work because we can always get to these squares because the king isn't going to cover those squares on this diagonal. It mm -hmm. only covers this diagonal, this square on that diagonal. Okay. So we have to stop him from playing bishop d6 first. Any other square is fine, and that's why we'll win in this case. Yes, yeah, really nice. Bishop c5 prevents bishop d6, he says, yes. Where, yeah, he's explaining all the stuff I just said. Yes. That's so com uh, complicated. That was a tough one. So I learned about it. In the what is the rating level for this section? Two thousand to twenty two hundred. Okay. Expert um, level stuff. King c six must be avoided. Apparently, how annoying. Mm -hmm. That's true. King c six does a lot. Yes. Oh, I didn't know CJ was here. All right, I didn't see hey, CJ. Hey CJ, sorry we missed some chat because I was really focused on this very hard stuff. Mm-hmm. And hey, trying not to learn. <laughs> Centurini, in the middle of the 19th century, postulated that a zugzwang isn't possible if two free squares along a crucial diagonal remain open to the defending bishop. This is how we saw in, in the first, you know, in the center pawn examples. Mm -hmm. He had those free squares on the diagonal, so he right. couldn't be zugzwanged. If the defending bishop has less than two, uh, then the stronger side will usually win. But there are a couple exceptions. Um, yeah, in fact, he writes Centurini's rule. A zugzwang isn't possible if two free squares along the crucial diagonal remain open to the defending bishop. If the, if the defending bishop has less than two squares, the stronger side will usually win. Hmm. Here's a, the following example will illustrate this rule rather nicely. King like this. Put this king there. Let's have some white square bishops this time. Yes. All right, this example right illustrates the rule nicely. I already read that. Um, it also shows the student how these ideas can often allow you to successfully advance upon that's as far back as the fifth rank. So the fifth rank is, you know, we've looked at is on the seventh rank, all the pawns so far, but now we're on the fifth rank, so we've got a little bit extra room to go to try to win this. But we'll notice that the defending bishop does not have two free squares along the diagonal, does it? These squares are both being attacked by white, right. so he's only got one free square oh, I see. up there. Mm -hmm. So this is almost certainly going to lose. And in fact, he does say white wins here. Let's see, called him ignorant. That's what he deserves. 
just reading some chat there. If white can safely push this pawn to a6, the game will be won. The white's first order of business is to chase the bishop off the diagonal, f1, a6, which is pretty easy to do, as we've already done many times before. We put our bishop on the square in front of the pawn, like that. Now he's got to get out of here. And bishop b5. Yeah, this is important so that we can, uh, you know, push the pawn. Oh, yeah. Keeping, yeah. And this is x clam too, because then we also have the chance to go here later mm -hmm. after we push the pawn further down. Oh, yeah. Critical. But black does have some tricks here, like this. Got to watch out for that one. Obviously, if we take the bishop, he'll take our pawn. King and bishop against king is uh, probably yeah. going to draw. So we don't do that. We'll instead play a bishop move like this. X clam. And you can tell here that it's obviously Zugzwang. I know all these things because they're written in a book in front of me. <laughs> yeah. But now it's Zugzwang. The bishop can't go anywhere here. And if the king moves off of the pawn, we'll take your bishop for free then. The king can't go to a4, that's illegal. So all the king can do is run away, or the bishop can run away from a6. Either way, we're pushing the pawn or taking the bishop. And black can resign, because this is the next move. I'm going yeah. to win. Nice. So yeah, that's the problem with that, that diagonal being too short. And you can't uh, you can't defend because you'll be zugzwanged like we just saw. You know, because if we go here and Black doesn't have to move, Black could just pass, then it, it'll draw. Mm -hmm. But the fact that Black has to move, classic zugzwang. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, everyone you know, should learn American sign language. Probably we shouldn't talk about you know, <laughs> uh, you know. Let's move on from it. Um. <laughs> And thank you for um, being such a peacemaker, trying not to learn. You're the best. But, you know, everybody shouldn't learn Chinese. Everybody shouldn't learn English. And everybody um, shouldn't necessarily learn American Sign Language. But I do wish that um, I knew all those languages. But, especially Chinese. But, um, but especially English. I'm going to die before I learn those. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Oh, 15 bits from Adam Dark Squares. Thanks. All right, so let's look at this position with some split pawns. Two extra split pawns usually win, since in most cases a stronger side can play to promote one pawn, secure the knowledge that if the defender can sacrifice his bishop, you'll still have another pawn. So. Thank you, Adam Dark Squares. Thank you, trying not bits. to learn. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> D6. Uh, bishop A5. The idea of Bishop A5 is to stop King C7 and, and promote, I guess. I can still play this, probably. No, no, then I'll play Bishop B4. And then if you push, I can take your Bishop with my Bishop. Or actually, even still, I can just wait for you and take this. But anyways, we can just play Bishop F6. And now black has no way to deal with the threat, which is king c8, d7, d8. You can't stop white from doing that, no matter what you do with black. There's just no way. Yeah. So black can resign at this point. And that's the problem when it's two pawns, is that when you promote one pawn, you can't just take it and it's a draw anymore, because mm. we got another pawn left. Right. So it's, it's usually very easy to win with two pawns. But we have to be careful about if it's a rook pawn, right? Especially a wrong colored rook pawn. Mm -hmm. We know about all those drawing chances we got then. For example, here, mm. put on some kings. And we'll have white square bishops this time. And white to move. All right. Hang on just a moment. OK. <laughs> Let's see. Got my fancy new mouse. It's working pretty well. 
Mm-hmm. It's a lot like this mouse. Oh, look, I did. Uh, you did mute it, though. I thought I did. I know, I saw you I think mute I it. messed it up. There we go. <laughs> Anyways, so here in this position, it's two extra pawns, and usually that's enough to win. But one problem is that this is a wrong colored rook pawn. Let me just make a point here. You don't okay. come on my channel and call me ignorant. Do it That's again, true. you'll be banned. Do not come on our channel like that, mm -hmm. talking all that mess. Absolutely not. I make the rules here, not you. Mm -hmm. Karen's channel. So here we, right, like I was saying, it's the wrong color rook pawn. White square bishop, dark square for promotion. And so this is giving black a lot more drawing chances. If we sacrifice the bishop for this pawn, then uh, it'll be a draw, like mm -hmm. we already saw. And in fact, this position right here currently on the board with white to play is a draw. There's no way white could win this by force. For example, uh, bishop g6. Obviously, if they play e6, we'd just go here and take it. No questions asked. That's all there is to it. So... We could try this. White could try to move the king so that when you push the pawn and I go here, you could keep pushing it if the king's out of the way. Oh, yeah. But the problem is after bishop g4, there's just no way to make progress here. If you try to bring it around and put the bishop here, like how we saw in other examples, we'll take this pawn. Oh, yeah. And it's a center pawn, so that's going to be a draw. Right. So there's not much that white could even attempt here. You can't bring the bishop around. You can't move the king and push the pawn. I'll just take it, and that'll draw. So this is going to be a big draw, pretty much. Big draw. <laughs> yeah, in fact, this, he ends it here. All right, let's look at another situation. Here's the situation. Here. We'll put this there. Get out some bishops. You all know how it is. But now we'll, we'll even give us two connected pass pawns. As you might imagine here, white's going to win. Two connected pass pawns in almost any endgame is winning. Like out of hand. You know, king and pawn endgame, yes. Bishop endgame, knight endgame, rook endgame, as we've seen with rooks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little tough. But, uh, yeah, this is, is going to be a pretty easy win, I would imagine. So white will play d4 check. Uh, and this is an important idea. You want to control the dark squares with the pawns and the white squares with the bishop. Just like normal, like in a middle game. White must be careful to avoid a blockade. If you play e4, which looks awful anyway... King d4, it's actually a draw, according to him. <laughs> I'm just laughing because it's just so complicated. In games, it's so complicated. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really matter if this is a draw or not. You know, obviously, this move's ridiculous. You yeah. don't want to block your bishop yeah, yeah. weak and all your dark squares. Play here like a normal. That's how a normal So I'm curious about how does it draw, but... So you can't move your king up because I'll take your pawn. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. You also can't move your bishop too far because I might go here and take if your bishop is not on this diagonal. Okay. So you can't, like, let's say you want to play bishop f1 and then run your king away. When While you're doing that, I'll go here and take you. And then I'll take both your pawns for my bishop and draw. So unless you got any, any, any more bright ideas, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tough to win it. Yeah. So check. King d6. E4. We'll put a pawn on a white square temporarily because we know we can do this next turn. Can't stop me from going e5. Got to get that king in there, right? Check. Again, don't play d5. That would be terrible. But e5 check. King e6. Now we can play d5s because we know we're going to play d6. Whenever we feel like it. 
like now, for example. And again, we know we could play e7. Bring in the king. Nothing wrong with the e7 check, as he says, but it might as well bring your king up. Can't hurt. It's not like black can do anything anyway. Bishop g4, this threatens big check. Oh, but you know, it's, it's better. This is actually mate. Mate in two. Can you find mate in two for white? Yeah, let me see. White to play mate in two. Bishop h4 followed by, bishop h5 rather, followed by queening is winning, but it doesn't mate in two. Mm -hmm. I see. My USCF rating is 2200. So my, my you know standard USCF rating, yes. Trying not to learn. I see. Let's see if anybody can find mate in two. Come on, where's the chat? I'm looking. I'm slow. Well, I was just asking the chat. Unless I'm uh, timing somebody out. <laughs> then you're quick on the draw. <laughs> it's obviously bishop h5, then queen. That doesn't mate in two. Let me see. Okay. That'll be mate in like, you know, five or six or seven, Nine. whatever. Ten. But it wins. Every, almost every legal move here wins for white. Bishop h3 wins. Uh -huh. Bishop f3 wins. Bishop f5 wins. Bishop d1 wins. I mean, I, you can't say, but it wins. Everything wins. Like, 99% of moves win. Well, less, but, you know. Most moves win. Yeah, king e6, bishop d7 is correct. Trying not to learn. Can't play king e6. I'll check you. People still guessing wrong uh, answers, even when the guy said the right answer. Oh, I didn't even hear the right answer. I said focus. Oh, I didn't say it. Oh, okay, good. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So still looking. Oh, Scottish Demon Go got it. B6. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see, darn. Or oh, are you looking at all of your checks? Let's see. No, why would it? Got to look at all your checks if it's mate and two. Uh, yeah, okay. I will do that first. But... Oh, wait. Uh... But yeah, this, this end game is pretty easy to win as long as you don't allow two things. One, you don't let the... Oh, defending bishop it. take both of your pawns for one and another is you don't let the defender achieve the blockade on the opposite color of your bishop like we saw all right what do you th what do you think Karen? well i thought was it um bishop h5 and king d7 and then queen is that mate uh oh no because it can take the d pawn right so you got to play the other check you got here Got three um, checks, but you know you got to play another one. Let's see. Well, if I move the pawn, that doesn't help. It if does I, help. How does it help if I check with the pawn? You have to look at all your checks. I did look. No, Was you didn't, because you didn't find it. Here it takes, and then where's the check? Um. Oh, and then I do, um, then I move bishop h5. Mate. I, could, I was exactly. fixated on exchanging the bishops there, and I couldn't. That also wins, because then you can push the king. I know, but you said in two. Right, mate in two. Oh, exactly. yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Darn, yeah, sorry I'm so slow chat. Attraction. <laughs> All right, you force the bishop to a square where it cuts off the king's retreat. Yeah. Mate in two. Nice. But yeah, you got to look at all your checks in every position. Darn. I, you know, I did, but I, you're right, not in every position. Exactly. I didn't return to the bishop h5 check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. 
So yeah, as you might imagine, two connected pass pawns is going to win mm -hmm. pretty handily. We have a little bit left here. I know it's six o'clock already, but w why don't we just finish this one? Yeah, this if you last think we can finish. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's only like it's only right. one and a half pages. We're gonna finish this up, and then I can play a couple of people if you guys want. Spencer has to duck out. All right. We'll look at some queen end games here. Just a couple of examples: queen versus rook and pawn. So in general, any pawn on the second rank, other than a rook pawn, will give the defender a draw unless the stronger side's king has managed to break through to the sixth rank. Let's show an example. Here's a, a Philidor example. Not the Philidor rook end game, just the Phil Philidor the person showed this position. Mm -hmm. Here. White to play. This is a draw. Black has all the bases covered. His rook stops the king from penetrating past the sixth rank. That's important, or the seventh rank. His rook can mark time by going to two safe squares. He can always play here, and he can always play here. There's no way those squares are going to be unsafe. He'll always be able to play those moves. White's queen isn't able to get behind the pawn, so it'll never be able to chase the king away from these four squares. The queen can never be on a square where black's king can't be on one of those four squares. Okay. It's impossible. King's always, it's always going to be there. So, for example, here, we can always just shuffle back and forth. Check us. Okay, now we can't shuffle back and forth, but we can still always go here. Oh, I see. Just... White can't improve the position at all. There's nothing white can do. White's king can't get in because of the rook. White can't zugzwang because we can always move the rook back and forth. And white can't kick the king away from these squares. So there's no way that white can make any progress. This is a classic fortress. <laughs> I just think about how scared I'd be if I was black. <laughs> yeah. I just Not anymore, though. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I just want to know what to do. I need to now you know. Just go here and there. Back it up. Turn around, back yeah. it up. All right, let's look at a queen and pawn against rook and two pawns. That was a pretty quick example. That's how I like my examples. Here, get some pawns on the board. Might as well give him a rook. And black gets the queen. So this obviously is tougher to draw because uh, of the fact that there's extra pawns on the board, as we've mentioned about 100 times since looking through this book. More pawns is more winning chances. But even this position is still a draw. White draws easily by shuffling his rook between e4 and g4. That's all you got to do. Black might eventually try to sacrifice queen for a rook and a pawn, like queen takes here, for example, and takes this. But that's going to be a draw, obviously. Clearly, frankly. It's important that the student, that's you guys, are aware of this block blockade since it can occur from many positions that might, at first glance, appear hopeless. The following position is a good example of that. See, it's pretty similar. This is here, there. King is all the way back here. Give him some more pawns, why don't you? And then we'll move the queen here. No, don't turn into a bishop. There we go. Uh -huh. Hey, Pattis monkey. White to move. So this seems like it's pretty much hopeless, right? It's rook and bishop against queen and pawn. Mm -hmm. Usually, rook, bishop, and pawn is about equal to a queen. So if you think about it that way, black's essentially up two pawns. Right. Um, but this position is a draw with white to play. Maybe you can imagine what the move white might be. Um, let's see. He does look like a younger version of Ben. Hmm. Might be true. Nobody in the chat knows. White to play forces a draw. Well, I mean, you could. Um, I do shop at Publix. Bishop yes. takes check. Yes. And then pawn takes and rook takes, and then you've got it down to 
What we just saw. What we just exactly yeah. right. The rook can shuffle between here, and the king can't approach. Mm-hmm. And there's there's no way to win. The king will stay here forever, or at least on f two. Either square, you can't uh, you can't stop me from being on both, or these four squares, h one and f one as well. So it'll be very easy for white to draw this exactly. Mm-hmm. Down a lot of material, but it's a fortress draw. Yeah, we're all public lovers. It's closest. I to do where like we live. Publix, Yes. <laughs> Don't go king g one here and lose your rook. Oh, oh yeah. Got to play king h one. Now you can't go to this diagonal, so we can go here. But can't make any progress. And yeah, if you if he stops checking, which he has to now, then we'll we'll finally safe in our rook, and and then we'll have we don't have to worry about any tactics. All right, so yeah, we finished the expert section. All of the stuff that we learned in the expert part of this book is is all done. So next we'll be doing master stuff, right? Wow, I'm gonna definitely need to review the um, six and seven actually. Oh yeah, that stuff's tough. Yeah. I could review it. Mm -hmm. I won't, but I could. <laughs> well, I'm sure you remember. I remember yeah. the bishop stuff but that we just looked at, but I'll forget it in a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you will. What are, you, what are people saying? We're all experts now, Vital. <laughs> We've kind of been ignoring the chat. Hey, Master John, how's it going? He even congratulates us for finishing the section. He's like, this is pretty tough. Yeah, that it was tough. Thanks for everybody sticking with it, man. That was tough. Tough uh, but fair. <laughs> <laughs>